sermons tonight, Romans chapter number 1, and I'm thankful that the blood of the Lord Jesus can make us whiter than snow, amen, and uh, I bless the Lord for that truth today, amen, Romans chapter number 1 this evening, and uh, we'll, we'll pick up where we uh, finished off this morning, and that is in uh, verse number 1, and then that passage that follows, amen, and so we'll read that together, and uh, I will, uh, if you're able, have you stand as we read the Word of the Lord together, and uh, Brother Tommy didn't have you stand for the hymn, so I'll have you stand for the reading, and uh, don't want you to get too comfortable, amen, and uh, after after all day Sunday, and it being warm outside, and, and you sit too long, you get comfortable, and you'll fall asleep, amen, and we don't want you to do that tonight, amen. Romans chapter number 1, verse number 1, the Bible says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let or hindered hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. I am a debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Thank you for standing. You may have a seat. Let's bow for a word of prayer together, and we'll get into the message that the Lord would have for us tonight. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight as humbly and thankfully, God, as we know how. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege that it is to be able to gather one more time on a Sunday night. Lord, Sunday mornings are wonderful. But Lord, Sunday nights are also wonderful. And Lord, I realize that this, uh, this period of the day in which we have service, so many are, are walking away from. But Lord, what a blessing it is to be able to be back in your house on a Sunday night. Lord, to be able to see these little children serve you in your house by taking up the offering. Lord, to be able to hear the missionary report. And Lord God, to hear about what you're doing for the cause of Christ through the missions ministry of Beacon Baptist Church and the faithful giving of your people. And Heavenly Father, we're so thankful, uh, Lord, that you allow us to support such missionaries that are making such a difference for you all around the world. Lord, and these two in particular in nations like India and Brazil, uh, Lord, we're so thankful to be able to be partnered with, with such men and families, uh, Lord, 
serving you on foreign soil. Lord, what a joy it is to hear about salvation and how exciting it is, Lord, to, to have those missionaries back in the States for uh, a time and to be able to spend some time with them. And Lord, what a joy it's going to be on Wednesday night to have the hindrances back. And Lord God, to hear them sing. And Lord God, just to be able to be here as part of our congregation that evening. Lord, it's like a family reunion. Uh, Lord, our family from around the world when we get to visit together. And Lord, we realize that we only have you to thank for that. Lord, that the, the, the faith that you give us is a faith that we share with all of those that are saved by the grace of God around this world. And Lord, we have a wonderful family in the family of God. And Lord, we rejoice in you for that. Father, we thank you, Lord, for our church family here at Beacon. Lord God, for the privilege that we have together tonight to be able to take this blessed old book, to be able to open it up. And Lord God, thank you for the calling that you've placed upon my life. And Lord God, for the placement, God, of my life here in this place. And Father, I pray that you would help me to do my best with your enabling to teach and to preach this text. Lord, to give the sense thereof, as the Bible says, uh, Lord God, to preach this verse and rightly divide the word of truth. And may something that is said tonight be a help and a blessing to your people. May the saints receive help and spiritual food that they need for their, their life's journey and their faith walk. Lord, I pray that uh, those that are here that may not know you as their Savior, they would receive, uh, Lord, the gospel from, uh, Lord, these words tonight that I give. And Lord, I pray that the Holy Ghost would take them and, Lord, that their heart would be convicted of sin and drawn to Christ. And Heavenly Father, I pray, dear God, that you would deal with the hearts of men and women. Lord, and those that are saved and those that are lost, as you see fit. And may we respond to you with obedience and faith tonight. And Father, we just pray that your, the results would be as you would have for them to be. May none of us, I pray, go against what the Spirit of God would have for us tonight. Have your will and way, I pray. And Father, we'll thank you, Lord, for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. This morning we preach the last verse of the, the first portion of this text that we uh, were dealing with between verse 18 and verse number 32. And we began to talk, and or we rather we finished our, uh, our exposition of these verses, walking through these verses and trying to uh, see what God would have for us. We uh, finished in verse 32 talking about uh, the, the, a snapshot of society in reference to the sinner's activity. And uh, the, sin, the, the sinners that are described in verse 18 through 32 and the spiritual, uh, the spiritual mess that they are in and truly how desperately they need the Lord as their Savior. Here in these first 17 verses we find the Apostle Paul as he begins his letter to the Romans. He tells us who he is. He tells us who his audience is and who they are in Christ and what God would have for them. And as he does that, uh, then he begins to tell them uh, why it is that he is encouraging them to be who God called them to be and to do what God has called them to do. And the reason for that is the spiritual condition of the society in which they are in that we have previously dealt with. And we understand this evening by way of application that that is exactly the kind of message that God would have for us this evening. Amen. That God wants us to be who he's called us to be and who he saved us to be and do what he would have for us to do because there are others in this world that are not as spiritually as well off and uh, spiritually as rich as you and I are sitting here in Beacon Baptist Church tonight. And so we saw the, 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 the sinner's activity, but tonight I want us to look at the saint's responsibility. Because we are saved and we are uh, spiritually rich in Christ and have God's truth in our lives, that truth gives us the, re the realization that because we
we are possessors of truth, we do have a great responsibility to those who have it and have rejected it. So tonight I want to give you a couple of things that we see here in this passage that is the saint's responsibility in a world that is filled with sin. Number one, I submit this to you tonight. It is our responsibility to be remembering our calling. Notice what the Bible says here in chapter number 1 and verse number 1. We see Paul telling us who he is. Here's what the Bible said. Paul said he is. In verse 1 he said, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. That is who Paul is as a saved individual, and that is his spiritual task at the moment of writing these words. He is Paul. He's a servant of Christ. He is called to be an apostle. He's actively uh, serving in that capacity, and he is separated unto the gospel of God. <clears throat> Notice verse number 6. He says, among whom are <clears throat> ye also the called of Jesus Christ. Paul said, just as I have a calling from Christ upon my life, you have a calling upon your life as well. The first step to us engaging in our spiritual responsibility in a world that is wrapped up and in love with sin and in love with darkness and in hatred of Christ is for us to realize who we are. Paul had no problem telling us who he was and who God had called him to be. You'll never be what God wants you to be until you realize who God wants you to be. And you'll never do what God wants you to do until you realize what it is God would have for you to do. So here we see this. When Paul was first <coughs> being led to share with the Romans what their Christian responsibility was in a sinful society, he reminded them of the callings that God had placed upon their life. The first calling is the calling to salvation. <coughs> Paul says in, in uh, verse number one, it speaks of his uh, calling uh, to serve. And I'll deal with that more in a minute. But look at his name. He tells us that he is Paul. Now, you know just as well as I do, that was not the way that Paul the Apostle was born. Paul, in writing his name, is letting us know that God has made him into a brand new man. He is letting us know that God has made a change in his life because the name that he lives for God by is not the name that he lived before his salvation by. This name, Paul, shows him to be a different man than he had once been. He had once been Saul of Tarsus. We understand that. The Bible tells us that uh, very early on in the book of Acts. <laughs> in Acts chapter uh, no, at the, uh, in Acts chapter number 8, we understand that he was uh, Saul of Tarsus. And we understand in Acts chapter number 9 we find uh, that the apostle Paul he is saved by the grace of God and he's made a new creature in Christ. The very name Paul means that he's not who he used to be, that he is a new creature, that for Paul old things are passed away and all things have become new for him. He never again chooses to go by the name of his former life, but chooses to go by the name of the man that God has made him to be as a new creature in Christ. That Saul that had once been is a just a sad unfortunate and a troubling memory in his life. That when he thinks of the way that those days used to be, he remembers the actions and their horrible memories to him. But I would submit to you that as Paul looked at those days in his life, no doubt he viewed them as almost as he was remembering the actions 
actions of somebody else. And the reason he is because spiritually, as far as God was concerned, he may have had the same face. He may have the same parents. He may be living in the same old place, but he is a different man than he used to be. Amen. It truly was when he looked back on those days, was looking on the actions of a different person because he's been made new. Here we see that the very signature of the Apostle Paul upon this letter reminds us of his salvation and his work for Christ as a new creature and with a new nature and a new desire to serve the Lord. And it is a reminder for us what God did for Paul in salvation. And it also reminds us what God has done for us in salvation. Here, the Bible says this in verse number six, among whom ye also are the called of Jesus Christ. Verse seven, he says, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, notice this phrase, called to be saints. When we as, as believers talk about God's calling, we almost always speak of God's calling in terms of a call to service. But you'll find out by studying the New Testament the majority of the time where God himself in his word mentions a calling. It's not in particular talking about a calling to service as much as it is the call to salvation. He says you've been called to be saints. You have been called to salvation. Verse number nine, verse number five says this. He talks about those that he is writing to. He said by whom and he includes himself uh, in this. Uh, in this he says by whom uh, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Can I tell you this? If someone has received grace that means that they've been born again. Amen. Right. The day that I got saved as an eight-year-old boy was the day that I received that payment that God made, and I received the grace of God into my life for the very first time. He said, we have received grace. Paul says this is something both he and they have experienced. All of those who are saved have received grace from God. We, are, we have all received spiritually from God that which we did not deserve through Christ and Christ alone. That is what grace is. He, Christ is the only way that someone can receive the grace of God. Therefore, this reminds us to remember our calling to salvation. Verse 7, I read it just a minute ago. He said that they were beloved of God. They were the beloved of God. They were called to be saints. Both of those phrases speak of their salvation. Verse number 7, expressly describes salvation as something that God has called us to. God sent out this call. Amen. Did you realize that the day you got saved, the day you got saved, it was because God through the person of the Holy Ghost had sent a call your way. He dialed your spiritual number. Amen. The Holy Ghost was the phone line. Amen. That connected heaven's message to you. Amen. And it reached you right where you are. And it let us know that there was a message from God that was for you. Amen. God sent you a call the day that you got saved. Amen. And if you were born again on that day, you picked up the phone. Amen. And received the call from God to salvation. And can I say this? While the call of God to salvation is a whosoever will call. Amen. When he called you, it was a personal call and it was not a party line. Amen. Amen. That calling from the Holy Ghost was for you. That message 
was for you as an individual. Yes, God sent similar calls out to the entire world. God will send that call to anyone and everyone. Amen. And I believe that God, amen, gives an opportunity for all men to be saved. He would have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Amen. But when he does so, it is a personal call. And can I say this tonight? I'm thankful that when I answered God's phone call as he called me to salvation, there was not static on the line. Amen. It was a clear message from him. And I knew what he wanted from me. And it may have been, it may have been a long distance call from heaven to me. But I'm thankful it wasn't out of range. Amen. And I could receive it myself. I'm thankful for that tonight. And can I say this? When the Holy Ghost sends a call to salvation, every call the Holy Ghost sends is a caller ID call. He lets you know it's him on the line. And he has something for you. Amen. They were called to salvation. I'm telling you tonight. Amen. If we are to be who we are to be and we are to do what we are to be doing in a world filled with sinful men and a world filled with those who are lost and undone without God and all different levels of spiritual degradation. Amen. I'm telling you tonight, the first thing we need to do is realize that God has called us to salvation and he will, he has made us new creatures in Christ. If you don't know that friend, what hope do you have for those that are lost in this world? If you yourself don't know that you're saved, what hope do you have for a lost world? He's called us to salvation. Number two, we need to understand our calling. We need to understand and to remember our calling, not just to salvation, but we are to be remembering our calling to service. Verse number one, Paul said that he is Paul. That speaks of his salvation. But then the rest of verse one speaks of his service. He says, a servant of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle. In verse 5, he said not only had he received grace, but he had received apostleship. For Paul in his life, he is letting us know that he was a man that not only was saved, but had received a call to service. It was a general call for him to serve the Lord as a Christian, but God took it a step further than that and gave him a specific uh, area in which he was to serve in the office of an apostle. Paul in his signature tells them that he is the servant of Jesus Christ, and he is one who had had a specific specific calling given to him in which he was to serve. Just as with his salvation, Paul's calling to service reminds us of our own, that if God followed Paul's salvation with a call to service, then no doubt, friend, you can take it to the bank that God expects all of those whom he has called to salvation, amen, to receive from him and to accept from him a call to service. Amen. He did tell them in verse 6 that they were called to be, uh, that they are the called of Jesus Christ. And in verse 7, they were called to be saints. I would say this, that word saints, yes, it speaks of their salvation. But I would say this, the word saints also is indicative of their service. As a saint of God, the Bible gives us clear instructions that being a saint of God means that God has set you apart for, a, for service to him, for uh, to, to serve him, to be on a mission for him. So we see here that just as Paul did for himself and he as he encourages these Romans, we see that first of all in the lost and dying world in a society filled uh, with sin and wickedness we are to remember our calling to salvation. We are to remember our calling to service. But I'd submit this to you tonight as well. We are to remember our calling to separation. Verse 1, he said he's a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Look at this. Separated unto the gospel of God. I'll say this tonight. 
that the, the idea of separation is an idea that is, is a spiritual uh, doctrine, if you will. It is a Bible truth that is becoming more and more absent in our pulpits, even our independent Baptist pulpits. So many are afraid to preach to a congregation, even of believers, that God still expects every single one of us to live a life of separation. God does not want us to look like the world and live like the world. Amen. He does not expect us to talk like the world. We are to be in the world. Amen. We're here. We live here. Amen. Until God takes us to heaven, this is is our residence. This is our place of service. Amen. But just because we're in the world does not mean that we have to be of the world. Just because we have to live here doesn't mean we have to live like we belong. I said it this morning in the invitation. God has called us to be ambassadors for Him. To represent Him. We're strangers and we're pilgrims. My pastor used to say this because his pastor Dr. Ed Maccabee used to say this. He used to say that a stranger is someone that is, a stranger is someone that's not at home. And a pilgrim is someone that is away from home. They have a home, but they're away from it. If you and I were to go to a foreign country, we would be strangers there. But Tommy, when the military took you to Germany, that wasn't your home. You were there representing the U.S. military, but you were an American the whole time you were on German soil. You were a stranger. And thank God you were also a pilgrim because you're here tonight. It meant there was, there was coming a day at the end of your, tour, your uh, tour of duty that you'd be making your way back home if God protected you. And I thank God that he did and allowed you to come back the way that you're here tonight and not the way so many others have. That's the way we are in this world. This world's not our home. We do not belong here. You and I in this world, friend, ought to stick out in the world in which we live. Right. To use the term that everybody knows, to stick out like a sore thumb, that's the way we ought to be. Everywhere we go, people ought to be absolutely distracted by the fact that's a Christian. They ought to know. You might not have to tell somebody, hey, I'm a Christian, for them to know you're a Christian. If you're saved by the grace of God, God's in, and you're living in the will of God for your life, God has deposited something down in you that will cause you to be different if you are obedient to Him. And that's the kind of life that God wants us to live, a life of separation. Paul said he was separated on the gospel, but there in verse number 7, he says that we're called uh, to be saints. That word saint sets us apart from the sinners in this lost and dying world. God has made us something that we could not be without Him. And that term saints carries with it a lofty responsibility of holiness and difference from the world in which we live. The Bible here says in verse 17 that the just shall live by faith. You are to be living a life that is indicative of the fact that you are a saint of God. And the reason is, Paul said, I'm separated under the gospel of God. I am separated. I am set apart. God has sanctioned me and removed me in a sense to where I'm different than the world in which I am a stranger and a pilgrim. I'm different because they have their purpose, but I have mine. They have their direction, but I have mine. They have their life's goals and their life's pursuits. But Christ has given me a life's goal and a pursuit that is different than theirs. You say, preacher, what is it? Paul said it in verse 1. It's the gospel of God. Everywhere we go, we are to represent the gospel well. 
Every word that we say, we should represent the gospel well. Why? Verse 18 through 32, there's a world out there that is dying and going to hell, that they have been taught things and they have embracing things that is causing them to have a hatred of God and the Holy Ghost of God still can reach their heart. But if they have to if they have to try to embrace truth over a multitude of Christians that are not so, of genuinely born again Christians that are not separated, your life of non-separation may lead scores of people to an eternity in hell. When you have people where the society at large is pouring into them all of the reasons why they should be skeptical of the church and skeptical of the Bible and skeptical of believers and all gives them all of the reasons that in their logic seems to make sense because of the depravity of their own heart is willing to receive those things. When they're being poured into them, all of the reasons why God should not be trusted, why God should not be believed in, why God is not who we say He is, but who they said He is. And again, remember, the depravity of their heart is going to attach to those things and love those things. Why? Because men love darkness rather than light. It'll be easier for them to receive the false because they in their heart, that's unredeemed, love darkness rather than light. You and I are giving more ammunition by a non-separated life to a lost crowd and to all of those that say, you can't trust those Christians. There's a bunch of hypocrites down there at the church. You can't, you can't believe what they teach and what they say. We're giving them more than plenty of reasons to disbelieve our Lord due to a life that's not separated. Our life, notice this, when he says, called to be saints, I submit to you our life is to be separated by our difference. They are sinners and we are saints. Not that we do not have the capacity to sin, but God's the one that made the difference. We're to be separated by a distinct difference. We are to be separated by our faith. Look at verse number 8. Paul here, when he writes to these in Rome, he said, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. What a wonderful compliment from the apostle to this congregation. Everywhere I go in the known world, amen, I have heard of your faith. I wonder if the world in which we live has heard of our faith. I wonder if the sinners around us on our job and within our daily sphere of influence have heard of our faith. Paul said, even though they were not talking about their own faith, that the testimony of how much faith they had in God had spread throughout the whole world. We are to be a, a different people. God's called us to be different and to live differently and to be different physically. But He's called us to have a different level of faith. I wonder tonight, where's your faith level tonight? Is your faith level anything to brag about? And I'm not talking about you bragging on yourself. I'm talking about that letting it be, letting it be known throughout Lexington, South Carolina, the faith that you have in God. Is your faith anywhere near where somebody might share the faith of this individual? Call your name and say they are a person that has remarkable faith in God. Do you realize that the one thing the one thing that the lost crowd in the world that we live in, there's, th there's two things that they'll never be able to counteract. They'll never be able to say anything against. Number one is your own personal salvation testimony. And number two is the diehard faith that you have in your God. That may, may not mean much to them, but if it means something to you, they can't say much about it. Do we have faith that can silence a skeptic? Do we have faith in God that can put to end the debates of those that would say, well, this individual 
they're just another part of all the hypocrites that make up the Christian church. We are to be different. We are to be separated by our difference. We are to be separated by our faith. I'll say this as well. We ought to be separated by our growth. Can I say this, and we'll read some verses here that prove that in just a minute. There's never been one Christian that has started out their Christian life where they needed to be. We all start at, at a level of practically zero, really. Because even if you're born in church and raised in church, and you may have a lot in your head until you get saved, you're still at the bottom level of practice and experience. You can't live a Christian life until you're a Christian. You can't serve a Lord that's not your Lord and Savior. We all start out at the bottom. We may have a head knowledge, but when it comes to experience and walking in the knowledge that we have, we all start out at the same level. We all have a day one of our spiritual journey. So therefore, the will of God for all of us from that day one to whatever day this is for you in your Christian life is for you to always be growing. Can I say this as well? That it will be hard for a hard for the lost crowd to have something to say against someone that loves God enough to be given them giving God day by day their life to the point to where they can see growth in your life. That things are different than they used to be. You see, growth is something that takes a period of time. Just, just, uh, well, it was Thursday, Tori. Thursday, Maisie's birthday. Thursday, hey amen. I get my, I, I'm, I don't have the ability to go back in my mind. We celebrated my, my baby girl's second birthday on Thursday. And we go back and we think, was she not just this big not that long ago? <laughs> For her to be as big as she is, seems like just yesterday, Wyatt was just a little baby we were holding that I could hold on one arm. Now I ain't got a chance in this world of putting him on one arm now. Do you know why that is? It's because of growth. Growth is something that takes time. It's not something that's done overnight. For Maisie to go from what she used to be to what she is, it's taken some growth. It's taken some time. For her, it's taken two years of time. And if you apply that into a spiritual realm, for them to have a faith that is spoken of throughout the whole world, no doubt that is something that is that, that has started on that day one and is growing in their life. Notice what the Bible here says in verse number 10. The Bible says, making request, Paul here is speaking to them, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you. Notice this by the mutual faith both of you and me. When he talks here in verse 12 about mutual faith, it is a, it is a large phrase in the Greek language. One store, source I read behind used the term that is a pregnant phrase. And the word means this. It, when he talks about mutual faith, it literally means the faith which dwells in each and which each manifests to the other. In other words, Paul here is saying that I am comforted together by, with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me, the faith that I have that is being manifest toward you and the faith that you are receiving in God through me and my investment in you. But think about this. Paul says this of them. It's not just that Paul is saying that he has received a blessing in his own faith in God that he or, or that they have received a blessing in their faith in God because Paul has poured 
and to them. But Paul, the great apostle Paul said, I am receiving a blessing in my faith in God from you being in your presence and receiving from you. This is a congregation that had grown to the point to where they spiritually were a blessing in the, in the life of the apostle Paul. In his spiritual walk with God, they were pouring into him as much as he was pouring into them. There is a mutual faith that they have together that is working comfort in both of their life. And Paul said in verse 1 that he wanted to impart unto them some spiritual gift. It's not just simply talking about what we would normally say spiritual gifts. Paul's not saying I wanted to come so I can lay my hands on you and you can speak in tongues or you can uh, have a gift of prophecy or knowledge or whatever the spiritual gift may be. He is literally talking about a gift of spirituality. That I want to give you something spiritually that is a blessing. I want to pour into your life. And Paul said that he knew that he would be comforted with them by their mutual faith. I'm going to give something to you and you're going to give something to me. You know what that is indicative of? Spiritual growth. Paul's saying, I want to pour into your life, and, 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 and you're going to pour into mine. And as others pour into our lives, we grow. And as, and as we pour into others, they grow. That's why church is so important. That's why, amen, that's why uh, being able to, as you can, go to other meetings and to support other churches in meetings and to go to uh, meetings, like Brother Tommy mentioned this morning with the camp meeting, it being around other believers, you pour into them and they pour into you and you grow in your faith and that, that growing faith is something that can be seen by a lost and dying world. I would not give you as old timers used to say a plum nickel amen for a Christian that is not growing. The hope for a lost and dying world is not a bunch of stationary, stagnant Christians. The hope for a lost and dying world is a group of believers who will settle in their heart. They're not satisfied with where they are, and they have to grow or die. Yes. <laughs> Growth is a part of our separation. He says that we need to re be remembering our calling. Remember your calling. I preached 36 minutes tonight. I believe I'll stop there. Let me say this. I wonder how many people tonight can truly say that as you live in this world, you're very cognizant of who God has made you to be. If you're saved, you ought to act like it. If you're saved, you ought to serve like it. If you're saved, you ought to be separated. Why? Because there is, there is a gospel message that has enough uh, of that dunamis, dynamite power to save the world. But it's not going to save the world over the backslid, hypocritical life of the person who delivers the message. It's been said, I believe it was Matt King Carter, one of, the, one of the old black preachers from years ago, tremendous, tremendous Baptist preacher. Matt King Carter said that he was told as a young preacher to not preach over your life. To not to try to, to preach over sins in your life and, and, and let the Word of God be something that never touches you. It's just something you share with others, and this is for them, and it never touches you. He said that an older preacher, an older mentor in his life told him, don't preach over your life. And I think that's great. That's great advice for every preacher, but I think it's great advice for every Christian. Yes, we are to be a gospel witness, but don't be satisfied with giving the gospel if you're not going to live like a saint of God. Amen. People aren't going to believe the gospel you tell them if your life is filled with sin. If your life is not separated from sin and onto the gospel. You're, you've been called to be a saint. God has called you in salvation and made you new. And by the Word of God and the Spirit of God, you can be what God has called you to be.
But so many of us choose not to be that. If we're going to be, if we're going to do what God would have for us to do and be what God would have for us to be, if we're going to have any hope in this society filled with sin uh, uh, of making a difference, the very first thing we've got to realize is our calling. Remember our calling from the Lord. Don't be forgetful of that, but let's remember that in these days. I feel like that's all the truth that we need to chew on tonight. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you need to come, the altar is open. We stand across the building for a time of invitation. In church, I'll tell you tonight, I know not everybody comes to an altar. But I will say this, there should be a spot in the altar for every single one of us with our name on it, this preacher included. Remember your calling. I'm not telling you to get too big for your britches. I'm not telling you to be lifted up in pride and arrogance. I'm telling you, just remember who God saved, for you, saved you to be. You're no longer a child of the devil. So it's about time we start to stop acting like it. You belong to Jesus. You belong to God. Let's act like it.